Now, I was, I, was, uh, I, was, I was surprised to walk in tonight and see a sign. The first thing I saw when I walked in was a sign that said, Prices for John Miller, and $10. <laughs> Although I, I went down the list, and I just want to encourage all of you to, 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 to uh, buy the Platinum membership, which is, which is uh, listed up there. So uh, I want to say thanks to Erica and John Amarati for having me out here a, a second time. They're great hosts, and I, and I love being here. Um, the last time I was here, it was called the Conservative Forum. Um, now it's, it's the Liberty Forum, which is great because uh, sometimes people will ask, you're a conservative, so, so what do you want to conserve? And when I hear that, I always say liberty, right? So that's what we're about. We're about conserving liberty. So that's a, that's a nice, uh, it's, a nice, it's nice to be called the Liberty Forum. And when I was here last time, I had a good time and, and, and enjoyed meeting everybody and, 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 and so forth. But my best memory is the one Erica just, just mentioned, which is I met a, a young man who was in high school called Garrison. And he, and he said, uh, you know, Mr. Miller, Mr. Miller, I'm coming to Hillsdale College in the fall. And I said, look me up. And he did. And I knew Garrison for four years. He took courses with me. He was a great student. Um, I never quite tricked him into doing the journalism program. But he was involved in journalism. He wrote for the campus paper and uh, um, was just a tremendous student. And he graduated uh, last May and got his first job out of college working at HUD, where he is the body man for Ben Carson. <laughs> Which, if, if you're a young person, you want to be involved in, in, in politics in Washington, D.C., is that not a great first job? <laughs> right? So I. I, I wrote to, um, and his mother's here, there's Sandra is, is here, she's wearing her Hillsdale, Hillsdale shirt, so, so, so thanks, for, thanks for such a great kid. But I, I, I emailed Garrison and mentioned I was coming back here and I, I remembered meeting him uh, those, those, those few years ago and I said, how's it going in Washington? And he wrote back, he said a bunch of things, but he said this, Dr. Carson is one of the greatest men I have ever met. Humble, wise, kind, faithful, and genuine. So working with him has been a pleasure. Isn't that nice to hear? That, that Ben Carson is actually the person you thought he was, right? Because often in politics we discover that they're not the people we had hoped they were. But, but Garrison tells us Ben Carson is first rate. So that's, that's, uh, that's so good to hear. So uh, let's talk about fake news. Um, have, 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 have you heard the joke? about the reporter who asked a tough question of Elizabeth Warren? <laughs> Neither have I. But I just want to, I want to, you know, I am a journalist. I run a journalism program. I've spent my life in journalism. And I just want to plead with all of you not to let 99% of journalists give the rest a bad name. <laughs> Now, I was looking through uh, some Washington Post headlines recently, and my favorite one was from recently was from last week in the Post, and this is the headline. This is true. This is not fake news. This is an actual headline in the Washington Post last week. It says this, can Republicans relearn how to accept political outcomes they don't like? That's what the Washington Post was wondering last week. Now, the, the more notorious headline uh, Joel mentioned, or alluded to, I guess, was when we learned about the killing of the ISIS leader. And did you see the headline the Washington Post gave that? Right? It was um, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, al austere religious scholar, at helm of Islamic State, dies at 48. <laughs> that was the actual headline in the Washington Post. And, and I don't know what your experience of it was, but that was like the best day ever on Twitter. <laughs> because, because everybody started inventing their obituary headlines, right? So there was one that said, Herod the Great, noted for his special interest in small children, dies at 77. Uh, uh, do, you, do you guys know the author Brad Thor, yes. the, the novelist? So he, he put up this one. John Wilkes Booth, 
renowned thespian, <laughs> theater goer, and passionate supporter of states' rights, dies at 26. <laughs> and then there was this, Adolf Hitler, vegetarian, landscape painter, and German statesman, dies at 56. Now, I think we have way too many Hitler references in our politics, right? We should avoid them, but I got to admit that one made me, made me laugh. So um, um, I, I want to start, though, with, uh, with uh, uh, a couple of lines about the press. Let me read this to you. The American press is, to a fearful extent, in the hands of a cowardly, mercenary, and unprincipled class of men who have no regard for truth in dealing with what is unpopular, who cater to the lowest passions of the multitude and caricature every movement aiming at the overthrow of established wrong, who are as destitute of all fairness and controversy as they are lacking in self-respect and whose columns are closed against any reply that may be proffered to their libelous accusations. Does that, does that sound familiar? That's, uh, uh, someone said Thomas Jefferson in front, it's not Thomas and Jefferson. It's William Lloyd Garrison in 1858. 1858, William Lloyd Garrison. So, so we've been complaining about the press for a long time. There's, there's almost nothing more American than, than complaining about the press. And so for the next three hours, don't worry, I like saying that and seeing the react, you know, <laughs> looks of horror. Um, um, so, 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 so tonight, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of journalism with uh, uh, an eye toward explaining the moment we find ourselves in right now. And uh, I also want to push back against this increasingly popular fairy tale that, that the press used to be a lot better than it is today in the sense that um, you know, things were so much better a generation ago. Wasn't it wonderful when we had a completely objective press that always told the truth, right? I'm hearing that more and more. I'm hearing it especially from liberals in the media who are often complaining about the mere existence of Fox News. I'm also, I'm also hearing it from my own students at Hillsdale College who sort of bought into this idea that social media has wrecked everything in journalism and made it, made it worse than ever before. So I want to push back against that a little bit. I think the truth is, is more complicated. And one of the things I want to say about the state of journalism today is that it's never been worse and it's also never been better. And so I'll explain that a little bit as well. And then also raise what I think are a few unique challenges for, for us today. Um, both as conservatives and libertarians, but really for every, everybody who's an American who wants to, who wants to follow the news. So um, a question I like to ask my students, often at the start of a semester at Hillsdale in a journalism course is, is what's the purpose of a newspaper? You know, what, what, is, what is the purpose of a newspaper? And, and they'll raise their hands and start to give earnest replies about, you know, informing the citizens and, and presenting facts to the public and, and so forth. And, and these are all good answers and there's some truth in them. But I always say the purpose of a newspaper is to make money. It's, it's a business, right? It's a commercial enterprise. And we never can lose sight of that fact. It's important to recognize and there's some great strength to that. There's also some weakness and vulnerability that comes with that when you're, when you're in the press. But we can't ever forget it. And one of, the, one of the downsides of the fact that this is a business is that you're always you know, chasing after readers and trying to get more and more of them. And today we hear about you know, clickbait on the internet, right? And this is you know, clickbait, which is simply to, to get another ad. You know, it's, it's, it, you, you know, click the link because it's a provocative headline or a picture or whatever and get, you know, because the, the website will get, you know, another nickel for someone having done that. Not even a, a fraction of a nickel even, but, you know, clickbait, right? And that's all about, about making money. But, but journalism's always had this incentive, right, with, with um, uh, sensationalism. Is, is a word we've attached to this in previous generations or yellow journalism all about selling copies of newspapers 
by telling fibs, by reporting fake news, etc. It's always been there. So the purpose of a newspaper is to make money. We can't lose sight of that. This incentive has always been there, and it's led to some very bad decisions and abuses of what we consider good journalism throughout history. I want to um, go back in time a little bit and go, go to the founding era of, of, our, of our country and talk about what journalism was like a little bit then. Uh, I'm going to mention three extraordinary journalists and one uh, interesting, colorful journalist from that time. Uh, one of the great, you know, sort of the founding father of journalism in certain ways in our country is, is Ben Franklin. They said of George Washington, Washington is um, um, uh, first in war, first in peace, first in the hearts of his countrymen, right? Ben Franklin is like first in everything else. <laughs> and, and, you know, when, when we think of what makes Franklin great, you know, what, what comes to mind? Diplomat, scientist, inventor. Uh, um, politician. I mean, all kinds of things he was, he was really great at. The first thing he was, though, was a journalist. He was a printer, making money printing uh, newspapers and periodicals. This was his business. Uh, he, was, he was an amusing writer. He published one of the great periodicals in American history, Poor Richard's Almanac. And these things made him wealthy and then enabled him to go on and do the other things for which we remember him. So Ben Franklin started out as a great journalist, an exemplary journalist, uh, someone, someone who's, who's, who's a model before us. Anybody read, uh, are, have you signed up for the new Jonah Goldberg, Steve Hayes, uh, um, the, the, the dispatch they're calling it? You know, they, they got the name from the writings of Ben Franklin. He's the inspiration uh, for their new media enterprise. Another great journalist from that era is Thomas Paine who wrote Common Sense, right? If, if the, 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 the document that more than any other convinced the colonists to declare independence against the throne in England. And uh, he, he wrote Common Sense as a, as a pamphlet. It's basically an essay that was published on its own. And the pamphlet was a great form of journalism back then. We've lost it now. We don't really have pamphlets anymore. But in that era, everybody was, they were publishing their ideas in pamphlets. It was, it was a, a, a fantastic medium for debating ideas. And Thomas, uh, Thomas Paine was a great practitioner of it and wrote the most influential one in American history that, 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 that spurred us on to, to the 4th of July. A third great journalist from that era is Alexander Hamilton, founder of the New York Post. The most, you know, the best newspaper in New York, right? And um, uh, so he founded the New York Post, which is still with us. Also, the author of the Federalist Papers, one of the authors of the Federalist Papers. And when we encounter the Federalist Papers today, when we have to read them in school, they come to us as a book. They were really newspaper op-eds. Every number of the Federalist was a newspaper op-ed. If, if Alexander Hamilton and James Madison and John Jay were writing the Federalist Papers today, they would be op-eds in the Wall Street Journal. That's how people read them back then, and we forget that because we regard them as classics of political philosophy. They were essential in the ratification of the Constitution, and we read them in books now, but they were journalism. So with those three, with those three great examples, we have uh, ben Franklin, the printer, who was, who was a great uh, entertainer and a great businessman, a, maybe the first media mogul in American journalism. With Thomas Paine, we have um, uh, the great polemicist in, in America, the first great polemicist, you might say, in American history. With Alexander Hamilton, the, gr the great persuader, the great, the great persuader in, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, in opinion journalism, you might say, in American history. And now I want to introduce you to a guy called James Callender, who was the uh, first great political hack, hack writer, hack journalist in American history. And Callender has this colorful, wonderful, appalling story, which is that he came to the United States from, from Scotland. He was, he was an immigrant in the 1790s, as so many journalists actually were. Alexander Hamilton was himself an immigrant, as you know. And, uh, uh, and, and, and Calendar immediately entered into the news business. And back then, all of the newspapers were closely aligned with political parties. Uh, 
In fact, the purpose of a lot of newspapers then was not to make money. They were, in fact, subsidized by the parties, and the purpose was to present their ideas and attack their rivals. And so Calendar signed up for that and, and, and became a Jeffersonian in the 1790s. Um, and and, and we, we sometimes uh, put the founding fathers on a pedestal for all the great things they did. And we forget the fact that they, they, they a number of them didn't like each other. They fought with each other. You know, Jefferson versus Hamilton was one of the great, you know, divides in, in the early republic. And so James Callender comes and signs up for the Jeffersonian side. And he started publishing and writing and so forth. And um, in the early 1790s, he, he published a pamphlet, which had a, had a bizarre long title. But in it, he accused Alexander Hamilton, who was the Secretary of the Treasury, accused him of financial impropriety. And uh, uh, it, it basically accused him of, of, of using his position as Treasury Secretary to enrich himself through some insider trading, essentially. And so he makes this accusation in print. And we actually don't have any copies of the pamphlet that he did this in. Um, it appears as though Alexander uh, Hamilton bought them all and destroyed them. <laughs> but, but we know what it said because there, were, there was a reaction to it and people talked about it and so on. We just don't have the original document anymore, unfortunately. Well, what Hamilton um, said in reply was, was you're, 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 you're wrong. I've not been engaged in this insider trading, but it's true. I've been making these payoffs to this, to this figure in New York because he's been blackmailing me for having an adulterous affair with his wife. <laughs> and so, and so this actually demolished Hamilton's reputation. And, and people say, you know, he, he, his life was cut short, obviously, but people say he was on the track to becoming president, but he never would have recovered from, from this accusation, which James Callender reported. In a, in, you know, he, he actually didn't report precisely what happened, but he exposed it through his, through his rumor-mongering journalism. Right? So this partisan hack journalist undid, in many ways, the career of one of the great founding fathers. You know, Hamilton remained active in politics, but he was, it was different after that for him. Well, Callender goes on, and he, he continues writing for the Jeffersonians. And then in the late 1790s, he, 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 he runs afoul of the Sedition Act. You've maybe heard of the Alien and Sedition Acts, right? But essentially, he started writing things that were so critical of the government and the Adams administration at this point, they threw him in prison. And so he spent a couple of years in prison for having criticized the government in his writing. You're probably wondering, what about freedom of the press? And so a lot of people were wondering about what about freedom of the press at that point. Um, well, the Sedition Act expired. Thomas Jefferson was elected president, our third president, and Calendar exited jail at that moment. And he came out thinking, I spent the 1790s writing and fighting for Thomas Jefferson. I went to jail for his political party to advance its ideas. I deserve a really sweet political appointment. And Jefferson didn't give him one. And so Calendar switched sides. He went from a Jeffersonian attack dog to a Federalist attack dog who waged war on the Jefferson administration. And he moved down to Richmond, and he became the first writer to put in print the allegation that Thomas Jefferson was sleeping with a slave called Sally. And so you've probably heard that story, which we're still debating today, and which we still don't know the entire truth about. But he exposed that also a partisan attack dog journalist. Is that the biggest scoop of the 19th century? I don't know what that is, but that's what Thomas Callender did. And you don't hear about Thomas Callender in, 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 in many histories of American journalism. He's a disreputable figure. In fact, when he reported on Jefferson and Hemings, all he had were rumors. He had no proof. He had just heard people talking about it. So he leveled the accusation in print. First person ever to do that. Turns out he may have been right. <laughs>
We don't entirely know. The circumstantial evidence is good. But uh, he put it in print. So that's what journalism was like back then. Full of fake news. Full of personal attacks. Also sometimes truthful. Maybe in unexpected ways. So that's important to remember. Now as we, as we moved into the 19th century, journalism remained highly partisan. Newspapers remained tied to political parties for, for most of the first half of the 19th century. And you see vestiges of this when you see a newspaper such as the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, which is the daily newspaper in Little Rock, Arkansas. And it has its old connections to the Democratic Party and it's still there in the title. There was um, in Springfield, Massachusetts is the Springfield Republican. You know, again, a tie to that. I just learned tonight that in Santa Rosa, California, there was the Santa Rosa Republican, right? So this is, this is harking back to days when newspapers actually had these partisan alliances. And during this era, we had great opinion journalism. William Lloyd Garrison was one of them. You know, this fiery abolitionist leader that I just, I just uh, quoted. His, his newspaper, The Liberator, was, was, uh, uh, one of the, one, it was the great abolitionist paper of, of that era. Another great journalist from that time was Frederick Douglass. We all regard him as one of the, one of the great uh, champions of, of human freedom in our country. Uh, most people encountered his work through his newspaper. He was a great orator. He was known as a public speaker. But they read his speeches and they read his, his work in a newspaper that was originally called the North Star and then later was changed to Frederick Douglass's newspaper. <laughs> kind of nice to have a newspaper named after you. At any rate, um, um, uh, what started to happen, though, is, is, that, is that with, with these partisan divisions, some people had a, an interesting idea about how you can make more money in journalism. And that's, that involves the, the birth of the Associated Press. And you guys are probably familiar with the Associated Press. It publishes um, uh, uh, you know, wire service articles in newspapers all around the country. Well, the Associated Press started when five newspapers in New York decided to pool their resources to cover the Mexican War. So it'd be cheaper to bring our resources together and get the same information coming out of Mexico because we want to cover this war. We're going to do it that way. So the Associated Press formed to do that. And that's what it did. A few years later, though, one of the key uh, writers for it had an insight. He thought, you know, we have all these, we have all these newspapers that, 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 that supply information to half the country, and then these other newspapers that do it for the other half of the country based on partisan information. He thought, what if we had a company that sold our, our articles and our information to everybody? And so the idea was we're going to have objective journalism. We're going to have nonpartisan journalism. We're going to report what's happening in Washington. Every paper, no matter what their political alliance, will subscribe to our service. And that's basically what happened. They eliminated a lot of the overt partisanship that, 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 was, that dominated American journalism. And the Associated Press is still around today. So, so um, um, that's where the, the, the idea of objective journalism is, is, is born. And it, it picks up steam, especially in the 20th century. Now, we're also dealing with the era of yellow journalism, the era of, of Hearst and Pulitzer and the newspaper wars in New York City. Um, you know, Pulitzer, you know, the, the most prestigious award in American journalism is named after that guy. And he was one of the biggest yellow journalists of his time. You know, yellow journalists meaning, you know, fake news of the, of the 1890s. Arguably, fake news led us into the Spanish-American War. You know, with the, with, 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 with the, uh, when the USS Maine blew up in the harbor of Havana, the accusation that the Spaniards had bombed it. Um, it turns out that maybe they didn't, right? Maybe it was just a boiler explosion and a kind of tragedy that was ran. But we went to war over that. And the New York newspapers of Hearst and Pulitzer led us there. All right, so that's fake news too, arguably. It's a disputed point, but arguably. Now, as this is happening though, there, there's more and more objective journalism. This idea that we're not gonna sell to half the country, we wanna have newspapers that sell to everybody no matter what your par partisan alliance. So this really gains, uh, 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 picks up steam in, 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 in the 20th century. The New York uh, Times, and the Washington Post are important forces in this, in this effort. But uh, how objective were they really? You know, back in the good old days, 
when you could get your news from one of three sources on TV and when they were picking their news based on what the New York Times put on its front page that day, right? I mean, do you guys remember that period? And, you know, w w was, was it as objective as, as people are now claiming? I don't think so. I'm reminded of, of Walter Cronkite, who was once the most trusted man in America. Remember how he was called that? Who misreported the result of the Tet Offensive in 1968 and possibly turned Americans against the Vietnam War uh, permanently based on false information. Walter Cronkite, who later said he would have been delighted if George McGovern in 1972 had asked him to be his vice presidential running mate. Remember how much trouble McGovern had with his running mate? Remember the Eagleton affair and all that? And he finally wound up with Sergeant Shriver. But that was the most left-wing ticket in American history, at least before 2008. <laughs> and, I, you know, seriously, right? And Walter Cronkite, so, so, so McGovern actually thought about asking Walter Cronkite onto the ticket. And then he decided not to because he thought Cronkite would say no. Years later, when, when, and this was all private, years later when this came out and someone said to Walter Cronkite, what do you think of that? Cronkite says, I would have taken him up on it in a second. He would have joined the most left-wing ticket in the 20th century. Walter Cronkite, the most trusted man in America. How objective is that? And so, uh, and, and, and on we go. We can give more and more examples of this. And uh, um, I'm reminded of All the President's Men. Terrific movie. Great movie. Um, it's also had a bad effect on journalism because it encouraged a lot of young people to go into journalism who thought the purpose of journalism was to bring down a government. You know, there's always been an adversarial side to journalism. You've got to be willing to ask hard questions. That's all true. But it, it, it brought in a kind of crusader element to journalism. A lot of young people in that era uh, swept away by Woodward and Bernstein, portrayed on film as, by, by Robert Redford and Dustin Hoffman, right? And what's a terrific movie, it's a fun movie to watch. Um, but sort of got swept away and thinking this is, this is the job of journalism, is to bring down a government, right? That's what you need to do. So they went in and started to, to think that way and influence that way. And if you think I'm overstating things, do you remember Dan Rather in 2004 with Bloggergate, right? Dan Rather, the successor to Walter Cronkite, the most trusted man in America, Dan Rather, one of three people from whom the majority of Americans got their news in the 80s and 90s. What he did, is I like to say Dan Rather putting the BS back in CBS, <laughs> right? But you remember, they called it Bloggergate because, because he reported these accusations that President George W. Bush had dodged his military service. Very serious charge done in the heat of, an election, of, 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 a re, of his re-election, of, of an election season. I think it came out like in September of 2004. Uh, the kind of charge that, if true, would have ended a presidency and maybe should have ended a presidency if true. Right? He reported it as fact. And then the bloggers found out the truth, didn't they? They started looking at the precise claims. They figured out things like, the letter you're showing us, Dan Rather, can't possibly be true. It can't possibly be an actual document from that era because it has a zip code and we weren't using zip codes back then. And there were all kinds of forensic evidence that these bloggers were bringing into the argument, right? And eventually it ended Dan Rather's career, as it should have. But, but, if that had happened 10 years earlier, when no one knew what a blogger was, what kind of effect would that have had? So I don't trust this idea that the press was once objective just a generation ago. I actually think it was, it was the opposite of that. They claimed to be that, but it wasn't true. And that Dan Rather episode proves it more than anything else. Now, the thing that made the Dan Rather episode even possible 
for people to fight back on that one the way they did was the rise of, of the internet. This great disruptive force, the thing that supposedly has divided us more than anything else, the thing that has made Americans scream at each other on social media and, and all that. And of course, this was happening amid a, a bigger breakup of, of, of the mainstream media. We had the rise of talk radio starting in the late 80s and really exploding in the 90s, you know, when, when, when they repealed the, the so-called fairness doctrine. Then we had the rise of talk radio, kind of new medium that conservatives dominated. Then we had Fox News come on the scene. Then we had the internet. And suddenly there are lots and lots of different kinds of voices, conservative and libertarian voices that weren't in the mainstream media. Suddenly we can hear them all. And this drove the left crazy. And so, so, uh, uh, so let's not fool ourselves into believing that the media was really great 30 years ago, was reporting only the facts, everything was objective. I know when I came out of college in 1992, as, as a right of center young writer, thinking about opinion journalism as, as a nifty career, you know, where, where does someone like that go work? in 1992. There was National Review, you know, and eventually I did get a job there. There was the Wall Street Journal editorial page, and there was like human events. Remember that newspaper? I mean, that was about it. There were some regional editorial pages, that sort of thing, but your options were limited. Now there's this whole ecosystem of conservative news and commentary uh, of, of varying quality. Right, but, but you, you, you know the names. It's everything from the Washington Examiner to the Daily Caller to the Daily Signal to the Daily Wire. On and on we go. There are lots of places to get information from. Lots of places for young conservatives to go work if they want jobs in, in the media. And so today we have an unprecedented access to information. Um, you know, when I, when I first got to Washington in 1992, if you wanted to get a copy of the speech yesterday by the senator, you'd have to call the Senate office, hope to get on the phone with a press secretary who was willing to take your call, beg that person to fax you the transcript, and then go stand by the fax machine wait for the thing to cut, sort of come off in that weird scrolling odd paper that it came in. You know, this was like half your afternoon, right? And, and it required the cooperation of other people and, and it, you couldn't just do it on your own. Now you can look up the senator's speech and have it in 10 seconds. And, and it's a power that journalists have, it's a power that all of you have, an ability to learn about what's happening, what people are saying. That, that we didn't have just a generation ago. And I suppose it's a conventional point to say, you know, gee whiz, isn't this a great kind of technology we have now? Isn't it wonderful we have computers in our pockets and this sort of thing? And, and like, like, no kidding, right? But it's, it's also, I think, worth stepping back and expressing some wonder and gratitude about this fact that we have this amazing power that uh, I think most of us in this room are old enough to have been adults, to have been adults when there was no internet. Right? I mean, you know, we remember the world as adults without an internet. Right? We remember what that was like. I like it better now. And, and, and what it means is we have this instant access to information, a lot of it good and accurate and reliable, a lot of it potentially misleading. But I'll tell you, I prefer this world to the other one. I like this option better than the alternative. It has lots of problems but has lots of benefits too. And I think it's especially true for conservatives and libertarians. I think we have a much bigger voice in the media. I think it's easier for us to get our ideas out than ever before. It's never been easy. It's not easy now. We've never had a better opportunity to do that sort of thing. So I welcome this environment in which we find ourselves. I think it's an improvement over the one that came before. Now we also have um, lots, of, lots of new threats calls for censorship. We hear them on campuses all the time. We also, dismayingly, I think, uh, hear them from journalists who call for limits to free speech. There's a, there's a journalist who just published a book called The Case Against Free Speech. 
I mean, if, you know, if a journalist can't stand up for free speech, um, what, you know, what do we have left? Um, you know, calls for Twitter and Facebook to censor content, all of that. Um, um, this is a thing to resist. One of my favorite accounts on Twitter, it's a satire account, it's called the DPRK News Service. DPRK is the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, in other words, North Korea. So it's a satire account in which it has the North Korean News Service commenting on political events in the United States and around the world. And uh, about a year ago, it tweeted this, calls for prohibition of fake news in West show wisdom of Marshal Kim Jong-un. DPRK citizens enjoy total protection from false journalism. <laughs> so, I can live with a little false journalism. Now, it does put a new kind of burden on all of us, though, when there's so much of it out there. And what it means is we have to know our sources like never before. We have to be careful about what we read, what we trust. Have you ever believed something because you heard it on the internet? <laughs> right, I mean, we need, we need, we need, we, we, we're, I think we're all a little skeptical, but we need to be skeptical constantly about what we hear. We need, we need to recognize what's a good news source, what's a questionable news source, what's not to be trusted at all. That, that's, that, that's a burden that we have to take on. We also have to know our language. There are tremendous abuses of language. Here's something I read last week in the Wall Street Journal. Great newspapers, my favorite newspaper in the country, mostly because of the editorial pages. But you know how on the front page, on the left-hand side, they have like their news briefs? Here's what, here's, here's what one of them said last week. Iranian conservatives on Monday celebrate the 40th anniversary of the U.S. Embassy siege. Iranian conservatives. So these are the Islamic revolutionaries, and we're calling them conservatives. Have you ever noticed that? That when the media talks about other countries, the conservatives are always the bad guys? I remember when I was a kid, this was a point of tremendous confusion for me when I was a teenager, and I'm not kidding. In the 1980s, growing up, reading accounts about the Soviet Union, and hearing about the conservatives in the Kremlin, right? They were the hardliners. They were the worst guys. They were the ones who wanted to go back to Stalin, right? And I remember the, you know, being 15 or whatever and reading about this in Newsweek and thinking, but I thought Reagan was a conservative. Shouldn't he be friendly? You know, aren't they, you know, but no, no, no. Conservatives are always the bad guys, always, everywhere. You read about it. They always do that. And here it is, the Wall Street Journal referring to Iranian conservatives. I'll get, I'll, I will allow, there's a, there's, there's, there's a kernel of truth there in the sense that maybe they're the most conservative and in, in, in a sense of, of, of a fundamentalist belief in Islam, whatever. I think this, is a, this, 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 this term is deliberately used and misused to confuse people. Conservatives are always the bad guys. So we need to watch our language very carefully. And that brings me to, to George Orwell, another great journalist. You know, we think of George Orwell as a novelist, the author of Animal Farm in 1984. And he was those things. But he was his whole life a journalist. He made his living by writing for newspapers and magazines as a kind of literary journalist, essayist, and, and, and so forth. His, his great success came at the end of his life, but he spent his life in, in journalism. He's um, um, sometimes called, I, I like this phrase, it's not mine, but I've heard him called um, uh, every conservative's favorite liberal and every liberal's favorite conservative. And, and you know, he was a highly political writer and it's hard to find political writers who are, who are admired across the political spectrum, but George Orwell is one, right? And his politics were a little confusing at, at times. Um, he did his whole life maintain that he was a socialist, uh, but I think the best description is an anti-totalitarian. But at any rate, uh, widely admired by all kinds of people. He wrote a book um, in the 30s called An Homage to Catalonia. Has anybody even heard of it? Okay, a few of you have. In his lifetime, it sold like 700 copies, right? Nobody read it. 
And it's, it's his memoir of, of the Spanish Civil War. And he, he went, you know, when Spain was, was, was having a civil war in what was, what was a proxy battle between fascism and communism before the Second World War, Orwell went to fight on the side of the, on the, side of the, the socialists. And he joined a militia and he actually fought. He got shot in the neck and was nearly killed. And, and when it was all over, he, he wrote his memoir of this experience. And it was critically important because it was in Spain he recognized that he had enemies to his left. He recognized that the Stalinists were up to no good in Spain, that the communists were up to no good, that they were enemies of freedom. And it was the first time he had that realization. It really opened up his eyes. So this book is, a, is essential in his own political development. It helped a, a, allow him to go on and write the other books that we all admire so much. And Orwell has a great line in, in an homage to Catalonia where, where he, he, he's, he's just met a, a, a Russian propagandist who has come to Spain to spread com, you know, communist ideas and so forth. And he said, um, he wrote this, Orwell did, I watched him with some interest, for it was the first time I had seen a person whose profession was telling lies, unless one counts journalists. <laughs> so, so Orwell was used to fake news. He encountered it all the time. And in fact, he was, he was distressed by the fact that he thought, he thought every reporter was getting the Spanish Civil War wrong. He thought the British reading public got misinformation constantly about what was really happening and their truth of it. He said, I saw it with my own eyes and uh, it, changed, it changed the way the way he thought about it. Orwell um, went on to write a lot and, and one of his great essays is called uh, Politics in the English Language. And I have all my students read it. Think, in fact, I think I had Garrison read it twice in different classes. But it, it, at Hillsdale College, I make all of my students in journalism read this essay by Orwell because, and you all should read it, because it's, it's a great document about truth telling and, and the way we often manipulate language in, in, in politics. And what he fundamentally says is, is that language should be a tool we use to communicate the truth. A simple enough idea. But he says, all too often what happens is that we become tools of language and language controls the way we think. And so he talks about this, this, is, this is why cliches are bad, because they're, they're phrases that we kind of haul out to express things in, in, in a lazy fashion, and that's language controlling us. But he says, in politics, it's particularly deadly. And this idea, of course, finds itself in his novels, when he, when he writes of Newspeak in, in 1984 and Doublethink and all that kind of stuff. Um, but in this essay, he goes on and he has this uh, uh, um, discussion about all the ways we can abuse language. And of course, we're, we're doing it right now, for example, when the Associated Press, whose history I have just uh, briefly recounted a few years ago, you'll, 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 you may remember, said in the AP Style Guide, which is the style guide that dictates how 98% of all journalists write their prose, the AP Style Guide says we'll no longer use the term illegal alien. We're going to ban that phrase because, you know, people can't be illegal and, and, and so on, right? But t tell me that that's not a political choice. Tell me that that's not a choice meant to, to shape the way we debate these subjects because it is. And it's an example of using language to control how we think. It's a way of saying you can't use that term to describe this thing because it may influence what you think. That's what they're about. Tremendous abuse of power. So that happens in our own world right now. Orwell in this essay has some great examples. He uses the word pacification. Remember, how, remember what pacification was in Vietnam? The word pacify means, means to bring peace to. You know, when we were pacifying in Vietnam, we were bringing war to it. It's the exact opposite of what the word means. He says we do this in our politics all the time. When, when a thing means the exact opposite of, when, when the word is the exact opposite of the thing it describes. It's controlling how we think about it. I mean, who could be against pacification? It sounds so lovely, right? But in that context, it means bringing war. And so we have other examples of this, like, um, um, is everybody against the death tax? You know, most Americans are against the death tax if you poll them. If you poll them on the estate tax, you know, they're for that. 
right? It's the same thing, right? And if, if you change the question, you change the opinion. And so everybody's against the death tax because it's unfair to tax people when they die. And then everybody's for the estate tax because it sounds like you're, you know, you're, you're soaking the man, right? That if, if, you're, if you're so wealthy that you have an estate, surely you can share a little bit of it, right? It's the same thing. And yet our view of it changes depending on, on which term we use. The politicians know this. The journalists don't always know it. When they do know it, they sometimes abuse it. Next time you read a story on the death tax or the estate tax or the inheritance tax, why don't you take a look at which term the journalist is using and how that might shape what people think about that whole debate. Another one, um, have you noticed on, on, on um, a, debate, a de debate surrounding abortion, whenever some state legislature in you know, Alabama or Georgia passes a, a, a new law, what's the word they use? The legislature has passed a new, a, a restriction, right? A new restriction, a new abortion restriction, which is probably a fair description. Right, you're limiting a right to abortion or access to abortion. It is a restriction, I'll give you that. You know what they never call it? A protection. So what perspective are they writing from? This is an example of how language controls what we think about a debate. So that's the other thing we need to do. We need to be, we need to be sensitive, hypersensitive to the way we talk about these issues, the way we read about them, the way journalists describe them, so that the language of politics doesn't control what we think. That was true in Orwell's time, was true in James Callender's time, in Alexander Hamilton's time. Uh, it's true in our time now. And I'll leave you with one final thought about the burden that's on all of us as we uh, think about free speech. Another story about Alexander Hamilton. If you've read the Federalist Papers, I think there are like 84 of them. They say almost nothing about free speech, almost nothing. And that's partly because Alexander Hamilton didn't think we needed a Bill of Rights. He thought the Constitution was a pretty good document. And he resisted the idea of a Bill of Rights. And you all probably know the story that, you know, we got a Bill of Rights partly as, as a mechanism um, of, of compromise in order to have the Constitution ratified. You know, once we added the Bill of Rights, it gave enough people comfort to, 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 to endorse the document and it became the supreme law of our land. Well, Hamilton didn't think we needed it. And in Federalist um, 84, I think it was, one of the last ones, he does address the question of free speech, finally, and, and freedom of the press and all of that. And he says, he says you know, it doesn't matter what any document says, what any amendment says. There's another line somewhere else in the, in the Federalist Papers about you know, parchment barriers, you know, just because you write something down, how important is that really? What, but, but what he said in this, in this context was, it doesn't matter what an amendment to the Constitution or Bill of Rights will say about freedom of speech or freedom of the press or any of that. He says, what'll matter is whether the people really want it. Because if they want it, they'll get it. They'll make sure they have it. If they don't want it, they won't get it. It's all on the people. It's not what the Constitution says or doesn't say. And I think he's right. I'm also glad there's a First Amendment. <laughs> I'm glad they went ahead and made that compromise, you know, just in case. Um, but that's what he said, and I think it's true. And we'll have free speech and freedom of the press if we want it. We'll still get some fake news. We'll get a lot of unfake news if we're vigilant and care about what we hear and what we consume. So um, um, with that, in conclusion, I'll just say uh, Epstein didn't kill himself. <laughs>、
that's their business. So this question is, how do nonprofit news organizations like NPR, and I know nonprofit has different definitions uh, along the way as well, does that distort the market for the news and or the reporting of the news? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so the purpose of a newspaper is to make money, right? This is a commercial activity, it's a business. Um, it's often been a money losing business and there have often been people involved in the news not because they want to make money, but because they want the influence. Mm -hmm. And so you'll find newspaper publishers who um, are okay with taking losses in order to have a platform. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's the same thing today with these, with these new nonprofit news organizations, NPR being one of them, but also some investigative reporting units and so forth that will raise foundation dollars to, uh, to, to report the news. There's an agenda behind it. And, and we need to be aware of, 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 of what that is. Bill Buckley always said, of Na you know, National Review was for many years a for-profit magazine, and everybody kind of laughed at that. And Bill, you know, Bill Buckley said National Review exists to make a point, not a profit, and, and he was willing to sustain losses in order, in order to do it, although it was, uh, it was technically a, 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 a business for, for many years, and now it's, now it's owned by a nonprofit. So this is almost the, you know, the opposite approach. What's your opinion of expanding the libel laws for, uh, against newspapers and journalists so there's, there's such a thing as too much free speech? And yeah, I'm, 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 I, I kind of like American libel laws where, where they're, they're quite weak. Um, uh, when, when, I, when I read about the uses of libel laws in other countries like the UK, um, it, 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 it does give me the shiver sometimes, the way, the way that, that can be abused. So I, 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 I like our, our weak libel laws that, 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 that require, um, that they essentially require um, uh, real, real malfeasance. In other words, um, not, not a mere mistake and um, you know, gross, gross error at the same time. We spoke a little about the power of language, whether you're restricting, protecting, and, and what that could do. Uh, the qu next question is, how do we fight those who describe Thanksgiving as Indigenous Peoples Day, and the power of language? Well, that's, I hear that more connected to, to, to Columbus Day than, oh. than, than, than Thanksgiving. But um, um, I, what do you do? I mean, we keep calling <laughs> it Thanksgiving, I guess, or, 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 or Columbus Day, and, 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 and use it by that name. Also have fun with them, right? It, it, um, 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 that that Indigenous Peoples Day strikes me as a you know something a few people on campus want. Yeah. It's like not, you're trying too hard. Yeah, country. that's just yeah. not not natural. Well, here here's a technical question. Someone in the audience would, would like you to repeat the name of Orville Orville's essay. Oh, it's it's called Politics and the English Language, and it's you'll you'll find it in in any any collection of Orwell's essays. It'll, it'll be there because it's the most important essay he, he ever wrote. Uh, it's also free on the internet. You can, you can look it up and get it that way. Um, it's, it's really great. It has great just some general writing tips that are really good. And then the second half is all about politics and uh, uh, what, a, what a useful document. I'll tell you quick, another quick story about George Orwell. Um, when I was um, uh, working full time with Na National Review, in 1999 or something, we, um, we, we wanted to put together a list of the 100 most important nonfiction books of the 20th century. This was, you know, it's 1999, everybody was making their 20th century lists, right? And so we wanted to do the, the 100 most important nonfiction books of the 20th century. So we, we convened a panel of, of experts, historians, and um, um, scholars and other people, and of course they were of a, of a National Review flavor, as you might imagine. You know, the liberals were going to have their list and we were going to make one of our own. And so I ran this project and it involved sending out ballots to all these people and it had ranked, and, you know, we had number, it, all these equations and this complicated scoring system. But the results came in and we tallied them. The 100 most important nonfiction books of the 20th century. What do you think was number one? No, that's a novel. 1984 is a novel. So this is nonfiction. I haven't heard it. It's, it was Winston Churchill's Second World War, the six-volume memoir of the Second World War. That came in number one. Number two 
was the Gulag Archipelago by, by Solzhenitsyn, his, his, you know, the, the story of, of the Gulags in the Soviet Union. Number three, nope, that was on the list though, but it was, it was, it was not in the top ten. Number three was an homage to Catalonia by Orwell. I remember getting that result and I'm like, what? <laughs> I, I'd like heard of the book, but I didn't rec, you know, but, but this is, this is the book that, that, is, that has become, um, in the last 20 years or so, has really risen to posthumous, to, to, to great, to great posthumous fame. Number four was Road to Serfdom by Hayek, and number five was Orwell's essays, his collected essays. So Orwell was three, two, two of the top five, you know, not bad, George. Yeah. Well, here's a softball for you. You commented that the press was biased towards attacking presidential power. Where were they during the Obama administration? We're still looking. <laughs> they're, they're currently on the campaign trail with the Democratic uh, presidential candidates. This is interesting. So liberals, um, there's a quote that liberals go into journalism to change the world. What motivates the conservative kids to enter the field? Well, first of all, not enough do. And, and um, John Amorati put this a good way it, when I, we were talking about this at, at dinner last night. And he said, um, when, you know, our first team, you know, the best and brightest conservative and libertarian kids, what do they do professionally? They go into business, maybe law, maybe engineering, medicine, I don't know. That's what they do. Where does their first team go? They do some of those things. They go into academia. They go into journalism in the media, right? So, so um, um, so first of all, not enough conservative and libertarian kids are going into journalism. And that's part of the. That ultimately, that's 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 the solution to the problem of liberal media bias is to get dip more and different perspectives into the newsroom. And that's what we're trying to do with with uh, the journalism program at Hillsdale College, also um, the College Fix, and 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 through some other other programs. But um, but it's hard to do now. Why are those kids doing it? I like to think that um, although some of them are idealistic and they, you know, they do want to maybe change the world or, be, you know, but they want to be a force for good. I like to think that they want to be truth tellers, and they want to, they just want to go out and find great stories and convey them to the rest of us. I hope that's what motivates most of them. We talked a little bit before about um, all through history, journalists and and reporters would maybe put a spin on story. Is there a precedent, and we hear this a lot, it's not so what the stories they're telling, but what they're not telling. So the, the fact that a lot of stories are ignored by the mainstream media, is there a precedence for that, or is well, that new? Yeah, that, so one of the most important phenomena to recognize, it's, it's, you'll read an article and maybe you'll, you'll detect a bias in it, but prior to the article is the question of what stories are we gonna cover? you know, are we gonna, are we gonna treat Benghazi as an important news story, or are we gonna use our judgment that that doesn't matter too much, right? So, so there are tons of stories that don't get covered, and we never hear about them, or we hear about them only in certain places. Um, um, you know, the, um, um, the abortion doctor, the, the Gosnell, mm -hmm. right? Who reported on that, you know? Almost not not the mainstream media. They didn't report on that. That that's not a news story, right? Uh, um, boy, was that a crime story? That's what that was. But um, um, I mean, indisputably, I don't care if you're pro-choice. That was a crime story. At any rate, um, um, story selection is where the bias begins. And so so what stories are they choosing to tell? You know, all the news that's fit to print. No. You know, they, 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 they print what they want, and it, and it starts, it starts in assignment meetings. Yeah, I don't fully understand the question, but I think you will, and will allow you to expound on it. How does your college website work? I don't know if this is the fix, or if this is something for Hillsdale, or? Well, I'll, I'll talk about the college fix, which is, um, it's a, it's a, it's a, I, I founded it about 10 years ago, and the idea is we, um, we find student students on campuses across the country 
and recruit them to be journalists and train them and get them to tell true stories about what's really happening on their campuses. And I have a, I have a team of professional editors who work with them and they, uh, they do some of the story assigning, they do the mentoring, the training, they work with these kids, get them to do real, real bits of journalism about threats to free speech, about incidents involving pol political correctness, about uh, curriculum battles on campus. And so we get student reporters to write about this. And so every day on the College Fix News site, you'll, you'll get new stories from students who are, who are describing uh, what's, what's really going on. And so uh, uh, it's just a good platform for news every day. Uh, separately, we offer internship programs. We try and place the most talented and most eager at, at professional news organizations where they can try out a career in the media and decide if they like it. And ultimately, we're trying to encourage them and excite them about journalism and show them that it's a, it's a fun business to be in, which is true. And that uh, you, can, you can have a, you know, if, if you're intellectually curious, this is a great line of work. And that, in fact, you can, make a, you can make a decent living doing it. But, you know, rumors to the contrary, right? There are lots of good jobs in this field. And uh, if, if, if you really want one, um, uh, it's, it's there for you. Okay, and you mentioned uh, people from our history. Who do you think were the most influential uh, journalists of the 1700s? Of the 1700s. Yeah. So um, I'll tell you who my favorites were. Um, Jonathan Swift. You heard of him? Yeah. Right? Gulliver's Travels. He was, he was a journalist a lot of his life. He had a couple jobs. He was, a, he was an Anglican uh, bishop. But um, Modest Proposal. Anybody read Modest Proposal? You know, the greatest satire in, ever written in English. Um, that was a pamphlet. Right, like like Thomas Paine's Common Sense, that was a pamphlet, and he was making an argument about how to how to how to deal with the problem of poverty, and it was such a good and compelling argument, and I won't give it away for those of you who haven't read it, because it has a twist, um, um, but but it's it's such a good and compelling argument we're still reading it today, so I'll I'll go with John and Swift, and then I'll say Ben Franklin, 1700s, right? Ben Franklin was um, um, he was a very funny writer. Also a great um, a, a master of, of, of the quip, right, the epigram, you know, I mean, a, a lot of these stock phrases, you know, early to bed, early to rise, I mean, that's Ben Franklin. Um, but, but a series of things like, you know, no pain, no gain, Ben Franklin wrote that. Um, wow. um, it's all there from what, from what he was doing back then, a highly, highly readable uh, 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 journalist. So would you care to comment on how journalists, some journalists would like to make themselves the story Jim Acosta was the name that was driven here. Has that had an effect on the profession or is he just a one-off? Yeah, so there, there are a lot of journalists who like to be a part of the story. When that's, when that's done well, you get someone like Tom Wolfe, mm -hmm. right? And sort of the, the, the new journalism, right? Um, that can be done well. Um, often it's done poorly. And and you get you get you get people who are who who want to be stars, as opposed to writers and truth tellers, and um, make spectacles of themselves. And and Jim Acosta is is probably the biggest contemporary abuser of of of, of that. You must have access to uh, people at other academic institutions that do what you do. Do you feel that they they try to teach journalists to be more neutral in both? or show both sides, or is it just damn the torpedoes full speed ahead for the left? I, I gotta say, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't really know that much about how they do journalism on other campuses. I, I, was hired, I was hired to come into Hillsdale College and we had a, you know, our program has a mission statement and, and which I read and which I, I believe in. And, um, um, uh, and, and so we just start, you know, started doing things that, that I thought made sense. And, and one of the things we do that I think is essential is uh, you learn journalism by doing journalism. In other words, we don't want kids sitting in classrooms hearing lectures from me all the time. They, they get a little bit of that. But, but we mostly want them working on the campus newspaper and working at the campus radio station because we, let, uh, we want the experience to become the teacher. And, and journalism is a thing you learn by doing. It's kind of like a trade that way.
Um, it's less a profession and more of a trade when you think of it that way. We do a few things in the classroom, um, you know, certainly with an intro to journalism course. I do a history of journalism course. I do a kind of, you know, a writing workshop and sort of an intensive writing workshop. So we do a few things, but we, we also try and push them out and in, in, in have them engage in the, uh, the practice. The other thing we do at Hillsdale is journalism is not a major, it's a minor, and that has it in its proper place. I think journalism should be a major nowhere. And that one of the great things about Hillsdale is our students will come and they will major in a traditional academic discipline. Will they learn real things about biology or economics or history and they can bring that into the profession with them when they're journalists as opposed to uh, being journalism majors and not knowing much about those subjects. And I'll give you a, a quick story. A few years ago, I had a young lady, she was a freshman, came into my office and I asked her the, she said she was interested in journalism. And I asked her the question that I always ask these people is, what do you want to do when you grow up? You know, what, what kind of journalist do you want to be? What job do you want after college or five years or 10 years after college? And she said, I want to be an economics reporter for the Wall Street Journal which was, yeah, which was amazingly precise for an 18-year-old, right? But I, I was delighted to hear it <clears throat> because I thought, you know, I can, I can work with this. Um, what do you think she should major in? Journalism? No. Okay, so she went on and majored in economics. She minored in journalism. She became the editor of our paper which, by the way, the Princeton Review called the number three college newspaper in all of America. <laughs> Thank you. Even though, even though Garrison no longer writes for it. And I'm not done. Guess where she's working today? Wall Street Journal. Great success story. We've been concentrating a lot on the U.S. press for obvious reasons. Do you have any comments about the international press, BBC, Sky News? I imagine we should concentrate on English language ones, but... Yeah, I don't, I don't read a lot of the foreign press. I do get some of the British papers from time to time. Um, I like The Guardian a lot, which is actually kind of a left-of-center paper in England, but I really, I really enjoy some of its cultural reporting. And uh, the Telegraph, which is a right-of-center paper, is also also very good. Um, a little harder to read. They have, their their paywall is um, tougher to tougher to penetrate. Um, um, and I'll say this, but so so I, I but I don't have a lot of experience with 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 the foreign press. And I'll say one thing. Um, um, I, I hope we can get into the habit of paying for journalism again. Right? We've over the last generation, we've gotten we've gotten we've gotten the idea that the journalism is free. Right, that you can read everything online for nothing, and uh, uh, you know newspapers and, and magazines are trying to figure out how to solve this problem, how to get people to pay for good writing again. And National Review has been doing this. Uh, the Wall Street Journal is mostly behind a paywall right now. And um, um, you know, if you want good journalism, and if you recognize the fact that the pur purpose of a newspaper is to make money, if you want good journalism, you're going to have to pay for it again. And I hope you're willing to, because if, if, if you don't, you won't, you won't, you won't get it. Um, um, so maybe, maybe that's a thing to think about. If you let a, you know, your hometown newspaper, if you let your subscription lapse, you know, as I did a few years ago, because I thought the quality was diminishing. Um, you know, think about is, is there something I can subscribe to and support? Uh, and get good information that you find rewarding and, and, and worth your money. I'd love to see us get into the habit of that again. I, I find it amusing when um, I'll, I'll you know, post some article of mine on Twitter, something I've written for National Review or the Wall Street Journal or whatever, and someone will, will comment, I can't read it, it's behind the paywall. Um, and, 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 and the implication is, you know, how dare you? do something like that and I always say well have you considered a subscription um, um, but I would like to see us get in the habit of paying for journalism again yeah, we've gotten spoiled with that certainly well earlier we've been speaking a, a fair amount about Alexander Hamilton and it's an interesting question have you seen the musical and if so what did you think I have not so I have no opinion of it but I, I gather it actually it, 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 it deals with the affair is that correct yeah, so I've, I've heard that. I don't know, is, is James Callender a, a character? I heard a no and I heard a yes. <laughs> so the answer is I don't know, but, but, um, but, but the play Hamilton does deal with that controversy. There's, a, there's also a very fine book called Scandalmonger, which is by, it's a novel, 
which is by the late New York Times columnist William Sapphire. And, and so you guys may remember him. He died a number of years ago, but a very fine op-ed columnist for many years at the New York Times. It's a book called Scandalmonger, which is about the journalism of this period. And it talks about uh, the, the, the Hamilton affair. It talks about um, Jefferson and Hemings. And, and James Callender is a major character. So it's a work of fiction, and it takes some liberties with what happened, but it's actually very, uh, it, it, he, Sapphire is very conscientious to stick to the facts of history as we know them. And he, he, write, he sort of writes into the silences and uses his imagination, and, and, uh, but, it, but it's a very good book, and it gives you a sense of what that period really was, was like. Mm -hmm. This is sort of a, another business-related question. The card states that there are uh, s uh, 95 percent of the news media is owned by six corporations. Is there too much amalgamation, or I, we all understand the the benefit of of um, consolidating from a financial point of view? But has that had an effect, perhaps? Yeah, I've, I've not heard that figure, so I'm, I, I can't. I don't. I don't. Uh, um, um, I'd want to. I'd want to fact check that. Yeah. Frankly, but. But I don't know. I do, I do think it should be easier for TV stations to own newspapers and vice versa. I think that would be good for the health of the, of, 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 of the media. And right now there are some rules against that. That is, that is a, a law I would, I would, I would uh, you know, they've, 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 it's, it's an attempt to, 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 to um, uh, uh, restrict the sort of concentrations of, of power and influence, but I, I think given the state of the media, it might be good to let some experimentation with that take place. So I might be for a little more consolidation, but uh, um, um, but I'm but I'm but I'm I'm spitballing here. All right. <laughs> for our last question, just for your own personal view, I think we'd all like to know if you only had half an hour a day to get your national news, what are the top three news sources you would recommend? So. Um, um, I read the Wall Street Journal every day. I, I especially like the editorial page, but I, I read the whole thing. Uh, I, I, I check out National Review, of course, um, partly because it's my employer, but also because I think it's still a really good product, especially the magazine, I think is uh, very good. And I read the New York Times every day. Um, um, I think it has, uh, I, I like to know what it's saying. I also think that it's reporting on science and foreign affairs and uh, several other subjects is, 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 is quite good. And it remains, it remains uh, for all of its problems, uh, it remains a, a great American newspaper that, 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 that we cannot ignore. So those are, those are three stops I make every day. Okay, nice wrap up. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, John Miller.